Okay, and we're okay. Ready. All right, so hello everyone and welcome to the Energy and Climate Action Committee in Amherst. Um, for those who are attending, uh, we are the group in Amherst that helps with policy around energy and climate. And um, there are a lot of things going on right now and there's a bunch of them on the agenda today. Um, so I think without further ado, we should just get started. Who is our note taker? John was last time, so I'm not sure who's next. Stella's name shows up next on the list, and then Lori. Uh, and if we wrap to the top, then there's <laughs> Andra, <laughs> then Dwayne, <laughs> then Ruth. So, Dwayne or Roof want to take this on? I know you both just did it fairly recently, didn't you? Yeah, uh, well, what goes around comes around, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you good with that, Dwayne? Uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, uh, speak slowly to start. <laughs> I got to get organized, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'll get on it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, we'll start then with just a review of the minutes from last time. I had a few last minute changes that I just sent to um, Stephanie. Do you want me to put up my copy of it, Stephanie? If you could, because I am um, i don't have easy access to it at the moment. I will do that with the few little things that I suggested. Give me just a second to get it up. Close that and bring up. Oh, great. It's not open. Hold on a minute. It's going to take me a moment to get it. Um, I um, just have to find the right folder. I thought I had the folder open, but of course I closed it. Um, Got to find today's meeting. There it is. And there are my suggested changes. Okay, let me make it bigger and share it. Share. ECAC minutes, share. Okay, let me try to make that bigger and bigger again. Hold on a minute. I'll make it bigger so it doesn't do that. New page width. Okay, now that's really big. So this all looks right from last time. Andrew wasn't here. Um, the only changes I had were uh, this note about we are having a presentation and Q&A today on heat pumps by Scott Chernock. It was really Scott Chernock in the panel, but that's okay. It was mostly Q&A. So I asked for that to be changed. And then there was a note here about questions were raised about the positions that bear. So this was regarding the Springfield Pipeline Initiative. So last time we had a discussion about the Springfield Pipeline and how we could support efforts of Springfield Climate Justice Coalition to halt building of this pipeline. Um, this came up originally because Andra had suggested it, and I didn't remember, there was a note here that said Andra recommends that the town council write a letter supporting the coalition, but Andra wasn't actually there. I think that was more a comment that we, she had discussed that sometime previously, but I wasn't sure exactly what had transpired, so I just changed that to, it has previously been suggested that town council write a letter supporting the coalition. And then, um, this was a little bit funny, a comment that I made. Lori asked whether it made sense to address this one pipeline when there's a more when the town's position on the moratorium is to end it, the gas moratorium is to end it. So the town uh, wrote a letter years ago to end the, to ask Berkshire Gas to end the moratorium on gas in Amherst. Um, and that was never, that's a still official town policy. So that sort of derailed the whole discussion of supporting this pipeline. Should we, should we clean our own house first? So I didn't even think it was on today's agenda, but it did make it back onto the agenda, um, which I think I'm gonna punt on. But uh, anyway, I made that one little change here to make that a little clearer that that was what the issue was, that did it make sense to address this one pipeline when there's this bigger issue of Amherst supporting gas in Amherst? Um, so those were the suggested changes I had made. Is 
That all makes sense. Should I keep scrolling through or? Still reading it? Suggest we add an A to CARP. Oh, yeah, yeah, where was that? Uh, I think it's twice spelled wrong. I saw it somewhere else too. Um, let's see if I can find it, C-A-R-P. No, nope, maybe that was the only one. Okay, good. So Stephanie, I already sent you this except for the double A on CARP. I can add that. Okay. And then, Solar bylaw. And then we have the items for the next agenda. Any other comments? Someone want to move to accept the minutes? Was there any public comment at the very end? It doesn't say whether there was or was not. I think there wasn't public comment at the end because we just finished the panel, right? Right. Then we ran late, I think. Yeah. All right. We might we might just want to add that no public comment. Okay. All right. With, with those edits, I'm happy to um Move that we accept the minutes as amended. I'll second that. Okay, and by voice vote, Goldner? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Berger? Yes. Roof? Yes. And Selman? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Okay. So now we are open for public comment. Any of the attendees have comments for us today? Uh, I think you need to raise your hand. I see John Hayes. John Hayes, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm uh, John Hayes. I'm in Salem, Mass. And I happen to be the chair of the city sustainability Energy and Resiliency Committee. And I just wanted to look in on your committee. I, uh, we have a state university here, and uh, so we're a college town, you're a college town. And I, 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 I probably look in on your agenda about once a year, and I did it today. Uh, and what caught my eye was your heat panel webinar, uh, heat panel, heat pump panel. And I was just wondering, could you just make a couple comments about how well it went and what it was? Yeah, we had uh, about uh, 19, 20 people in the audience. I think it was a high of 20, um, but mostly about 19 people in the audience. So that for us was huge. We had we had a lot of people attending and I don't know about anyone else, but I've already gotten a couple of follow-up emails um, from people wanting to know more. So what we did is we got a local uh, contractor who owns one of, he actually is owner, I think, of one of the local um, installation firms that does heat pump installations. Okay. And he gave a little 15, 20 minute introduction to heat pumps that he took out all the mention of his business, which I thought was very nice. <laughs> and then we just sorry, he took out all the what? All mention of his individual business. So it really was oh, just oh, okay. a brief introduction to heat pumps, which was which was nice. Um, and then uh, the bunch, bunch of us on the panel on this on this committee um have done transitions recently so we each spent a minute just introducing the transition we've done and uh opening up for questions and there were a lot of questions so oh, wow. i think it went pretty well um, and, and you meant that your some of your panel members actually have have mini splits yeah we have we have mini splits we have ducted we have heat pump hot water heaters we have hybrid oh. systems we have everything oh Sorry, very cool Stephanie. Yeah, I just wanted to let John know that if he goes to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel, all right, the videos of our committee meetings are posted, and you can go to the Energy and Climate Action Committee meeting of May 10th, 
2023 and you can watch the recording and you can see the the heat pump presentation and the panel discussion thank you I th I'll, I'll check out the presentation I, thank you very much you're welcome yeah john that was actually a follow-up on some uh, other stuff we had done there's a lot of good heat pump uh seminars out there by like green energy consumers alliance yep. and i forget who else and so we had watched one of those together at one point and um, it was, but it seemed like people just wanted to talk about it. Uh, right. Everybody has done a different transition and everybody has a different house and it was helpful to hear all the different stories. So if I had attended, so, so I'm looking into getting many, many splits for my home right now. I have solar panels on the roof, but, uh, but if I had um, attended your audience, it was an audience member, my question for you guys that actually have the mini splits would have been, how was it when you when the polar vortex hit and we had very, very cold temperatures? Uh, do some of you not have a furnace? Are you pure air source heat pumps? Or do you have a backup furnace? Does anyone not have backup? I, I'm not sure if any of us are purists. <laughs> okay. No, I am. I, am. Okay. I have a backup furnace. Um, it worked. It worked fine. Um, our electricity bill was a bit higher because of course solar doesn't work as well in the winter and that's when it's cold, but um, sort of averaged out over the year. I don't think, I think it's on par, maybe a little bit cheaper than our oil used to be. Um, right. No, I wasn't so worried about the money. I was just, I didn't know if anybody was pure heat pumps and then how it was in their, in their home with the, uh, with 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 the severely cold temperatures, even though it was short lived, it wasn't a long lasting cold wave. But it, I just that's that was why my question was. But so thank you. Yeah, our, our our the the problem we did have one time when it snowed was that snow covered it, and so we had to like uncover it. That's sure, the, sure. that's the main problem. We that's the only time the heat wasn't working as well. All right. We, we, we also you. I can I can also say that a properly designed system has no trouble serving its load um, okay. in sub-zero temperatures. Okay. Very, okay. Thanks, Jesse. Sure. All right. I don't want to hog your meeting, so thank you so much for your... Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just listen now for a while. For, thank you. Thank you, John. Any other comments? That meeting recording, it looks like it's been watched 121 times. Whoa. So. Wow. I've shared it, I think, too. We're going viral. <laughs> well, <laughs> viral. Finance committee meeting last month, they got 705, and a board of health meeting got 5.2 thousand. So we're not up there with other town <laughs> committees, but we're doing pretty good. <laughs> I don't see any other hands up. All right, so then let's go on to our updates. Um, Don is not here. So I guess we won't hear about the PACE update, although I will be talking about specialized stretch code later. Um, and uh, solar, Dwayne, do you have a solar update for us? Well, we have a report. Which I haven't looked at yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, so just, maybe you should tell us what, that, what happened though. Yeah, give us an update on the report coming out at least. Yeah. Well, maybe that's more of a staff update from Stephanie when okay. we get there, but um, uh, but uh, um, I don't really have an update. I mean, the solar working, the solar bylaw working group continues to work. <laughs> um, we are meeting tomorrow, uh, as we do each each Friday, same weeks as uh, ECAC for the most part, um, and we are at this point focused a bit on what we call these nexus statements of trying to set the vision and the purpose and the guiding principles associated with the bylaw, uh, which is sort of an articulation of the yin and the yang of having a climate emergency to work with and, and to be proactive and contribute to those solutions, uh, but also uh, um, to also um, be um, respective, respectful um, and, uh, purposeful to try to minimize harm associated with um, siting and, and land use. Um, so we're working our way through that and that'll be the main content for tomorrow. Okay, great, thanks, Dwayne. Um, 
Is there anything, are you gonna give us a, a Stephanie, a staff update on that solar report? Um, just, just to, well, um, I guess it was gonna be very brief. Um, um, my, oh, okay. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say my staff update is later in the agenda, so I, I would give it just a quick one then. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so Andra is still not here today, so we're gonna to have to put that one off. This might be a short meeting, but I do have something I wanted to bounce off of everyone. Um, so one of the things that I spent quite a lot of time on this week, um, I guess we're, I guess just to be clear, we're skipping over the letter to the new DPU commissioners because Andra is not here. Um, so we're going on to item five, which is the specialized stretch code. So uh, I spent quite a lot of time this week. Uh, I sent a bunch of materials that were, there were links and number of links to, in the um, packet for this meeting uh, to webinars and information about um, how other towns are uh, getting the specialized, the new specialized stretch code adopted. Um, and at the same time, I tried to put together a little PowerPoint. Uh, I took the DOER PowerPoint and looked at what some other towns had did and just tried to fill in a few things. But I have some questions that I would bet, for example, Jesse uh, might know the answer to, or maybe Steve. Let's see. So why don't I, um, can I share this document? It's a sort of a document in progress um, with you guys. Is that okay? And then I'll send it to you afterwards, Stephanie. Just, right. just for the uh, sorry uh, for the minutes here. Are we now on on part four? Five, I think. Right? Isn't this five? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it is five. That's why I missed it. Um, anything on the on on four? That okay. You mentioned that. Okay. Because yeah, Andre's not here. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um. So uh, let me go ahead and share this. Let me just put it in some sort of mode where you can actually see it. And then let me share it. Stretch code. Okay. Um, let me go to the first one. All right, let me move this where I can see it. Okay, good. And now I've got you guys over here. Just a moment. All right, so now I can see everyone. Okay, so. Um, this was, I think, designed to be something to show to the town council. Is that right, Stephanie? Or in consideration, the idea being that we want to get in front of the town council um, a vote on this new specialized stretch code. And so right. if we do that, it would be nice to have some PowerPoint slides to go through. Um, so the Building Electrification Accelerator, which is a statewide group that has been collecting lots of presentations from different towns on this topic um, and, and providing links to things like the DOER webinar on this topic um, and linking in other places that are, that are uh, other, other useful resources. Anyway, I went through as much of that as I had time and bandwidth for and tried to pull together a few things. And mostly what I did was make use of the slides from DOER. So, the presentation is, you know, why should Amherst adopt this new specialized code? It, all it takes is a, is a vote, the same way the stretch code was adopted some years ago. So in the way of background, there are now three levels of building code in Massachusetts, increasingly green. There's this base code, which I think almost no one uses. There's only a few towns that haven't opted in to the, what's called the stretch code. Amherst opted in in 2011. Um, and then, on, and then, you know, these are increasingly green, right? So there's the base code, there's the stretch code, which almost all communities have opted into. And then there's a specialized code, which became available now about, what, six months ago, um, and has now been adopted by more than 16 communities uh, representing 70% of the state's population. This includes Boston and Arlington. And every day there's another announcement out of BEA who, for more towns that are opting in. So that's sort of the background. Um, Diving in a little bit more, and this is taking, again, this is the, a DOER slide. I left a little DOER symbol in the corner of the ones that I took directly or just maybe modified a little bit. Um, the base code, we don't really need to worry about. Nobody uses it. The stretch code that we're using uh, in, had, had a 2023 update, which made it even greener. Um, 
and it involves both new construction and major renovations. So if you pretty much rebuild, the, you know, if you've got a house, you're going to be currently in Amherst building under this 2023 stretch code, uh, under, under the updated stretch code. And again, most communities in Massachusetts have opted into this. Oh, I didn't even realize there are 52 that are still using the base code. I'm surprised it's that high. So there's 299 communities that are using the stretch code. Um, and it involves both residential and commercial. There are separate rules for residential and commercial construction. A, a major difference of the specialized code is I think it only concerns new construction. And in order to opt into this, we have to do the same thing we did for the stretch code, which is we need a vote of the town council. Um, I don't even think it's a bylaw. I think it's just a opt-in. There's a little discussion about it here. Yeah. I don't think, I think it, I think it does affect renovation as well over a certain size. Uh, maybe, but I couldn't, maybe, I, I thought not, but, um, let's keep okay. going and maybe we'll find it there. I did have some questions for you, Jesse, later, um, because the stretch code seems to cover some cases where the specialized code doesn't. So I guess that means that if we adopt the specialized code, are we throwing away the rules for the small, for the renovations that are covered by the stretch code, right? That was actually one of the questions I had that I didn't know the answer to yet. Or, or do these, do the stretch codes still apply in cases where the specialized code doesn't? I, I believe that's how it works. I, I think it's cumulative. Okay, cool. All right. So then I put one quick slide together, just why is this urgently needed? Um, and first of all, we have the, the CARP that this committee, a previous version of, you know, helped write and, and plan. Um, so including, including some of the current members. So we have a, a climate plan for the community. And if we're gonna meet those goals, then these are the sorts of changes that absolutely have to happen. Um, also for meeting state goals, right? We really need buildings to be greener than we're currently building them. Um, it's also true that building codes generally are a powerful tool for uh, social justice, right? Making sure that people are living in safe, safe housing, right? That, that everybody is, that you don't get safer housing if you're, if you're wealthier. Everybody has the same ex experience in their, in the safety in their home and the energy efficiency of their home. Um, so this is a, you know, if we're worried about social justice, if we're worried about, about equity, then building codes are a good way to go. And it also sends a message to Beacon Hill, to our legislators in, in uh, Massachusetts government that we really want a net zero building code. We want to see this in place. You know, we want them to take this seriously. So it'd be very sad if they gave us the opportunity to do this and then nobody opted in, right? Um, that wouldn't be helpful. So these are, I think, the three biggest reasons I could think of. And they, this is actually distilled down from a document put out by, I forget if it's the Sierra Club or there was some document that uh, was linked on the BEA site that was a toolkit. And it, it was about three pages and I distilled it down into three bullets. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so the benefits of the specialized code are that, generally speaking, it, it lowers costs overall. Uh, it protects against having to do costly retrofits down the road. So you put in gas today, and then later on they turn off the gas, and now you have to, you know, retrofit your house maybe before you would have otherwise needed to. Um, it gives contractors some stability. They know what to expect, so they can plan. Um, the same, I think it was Sierra Club document pointed out that the number of contractors able to do the work, this sort of work is large and growing, demonstrating that there is an industry shift. And as that industry shifts, costs of course come down as you have more and more people doing this sort of work. Um, and in a lot of cases, electrification can reduce utility bills. And if there are small upfront costs, they tend to be recouped in a few years. We all know there are exceptions to that um, with gas and, uh, that won't stay that way forever, but right now we have the unfortunate situation that gas is a lot cheaper than anything else. Um, but if you have to retrofit your house in a few years, it won't be a lot cheaper. 
Uh, and finally, there's health and safety. This isn't really an issue in, well, it, it is sort of in Amherst. In, in Amherst, we, to the extent that we have, the health risks of indoor methane, of methane stoves, of having methane in your house are only in the last decade or so really becoming recognized. It, they now, there, a few years ago, there was a study that showed that 15% of asthma, childhood asthma in Massachusetts was because of leaky methane. It was because of methane mostly in the house. Um, methane is a greenhouse gas. It's 25, more time, 25 times more potent than CO2. Uh, it leaks out all over the place. It leaks out if you have a stove, you're going to get some in your house. And this causes problems. And generally speaking, heat pumps are safer ways to heat than any sort of fossil fuel. So if you're burning, if you have a furnace in your house, that's always going to be more dangerous than using a heat pump. So there are health and safety um, benefits of the specialized code above and beyond what the stretch code does. All right. So before I even get into a little bit more about what the stretch code is, um, about the, what the specialized code is, reasons that the stretch code aren't quite enough. The stretch code still permits and makes it easy to use fossil fuel and fossil fuel infrastructure in building new buildings, so long as the HERS rating, which is a rating of the efficiency of the home, of the, of the heat, how well heat sealed it is, how, well, how small a heat leak it has, right? Um, if the HERS rating is sufficiently low, if you design it well enough, you can put in all the fossil fuel you want. Um, the specialized code does better requiring that, it actually still does have a pathway for fossil fuel, but if you're gonna be using fossil fuel, you have to be net zero, meaning you have to have solar on your roof, right? You have to be doing something to offset the fact that you're using fossil fuels. Um, it actually makes it sufficiently difficult to do fossil fuel uh, to put fossil fuel in a new build that chances are nobody will do it or very few people want to do it. There is a very detailed comparison and a webinar and I didn't want in this particular presentation to go through that. I was trying to keep this to six or seven slides, maybe eight slides, right? But my suggestion would be if we're going to ask the town council to vote on this thing, they really should look at the DOER webinar recording on the topic which I watched again as I was putting this together to remind myself of this stuff. Um, and finally, uh, let's see what else was in here. Specialized code, there's, I guess there's nine slides. And then, and then it, eh, a little bit more than nine. All right, so then there's some, some specific things on the code and this is all covered in that webinar. But just for our own, just to remind everyone if you haven't watched, um, the webinar. Uh, the adoption process, again, is similar to what we did with the stretch code. I don't know which of these. This is a slide I needed some help with because I don't know what the right process in Amherst is. So if we use this, a presentation like this, somebody, maybe Stephanie, would have to go through and, you know, what is the adoption process in Amherst? It's similar to what we did for the stretch code. What do we do for the stretch code? All right. Stephanie? Oh, sorry, I didn't know if you were asking or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go sorry. Ahead. If you have a um, comment. Well, at the, you know, it was a different time. So we went through town meetings. So right. it's different. that was, you know, <laughs> there was a lot more community outreach um, involved in that. We had Jim Berry, who was the regional coordinator um, for the Western Mass region of the Green Communities Program, come mm -hmm. out and um, actually he came out a few times. He came out once in person and did a presentation for folks uh, live. And then we also recorded the presentation that he did at Amherst Media and then put it out over the airwaves for, for about a month or so prior to the vote. Um, so there was much more um, targeted outreach into the community to make sure that people had the information to even understand what the stretch code was. I mean, at this point, you know, we know about the stretch code. So this is just sort of saying that we're taking it that much further and sort of talking about what those additional um, guidelines would be. Right. So, I, and I think, you know, getting the information to the town council is important and, you know, certainly what you're doing here. Uh, so people have access through the, the media channel and the YouTube link to see the recording is really helpful. Yeah. But we didn't have these things in place when we did this with the stretch code the first time. Okay. So all of this additional technology that we have accessible to people is really helpful. Right. Right. And we could probably, I mean, if you were, 
you know, it, it, we might be able to get something up on the, you know, if, if this is going to go before the town council, it might be prudent for us to have something on the town's website on the main page that's just kind of an informational piece about what the specialized stretch code is and what that would mean. Uh, I know, I can tell you that already, um, I kind of overheard a conversation the other day that our inspectors are concerned just in that the um, the updated stretch code um, information isn't necessarily getting out to those that it will be um, that will be impacted by it. So they're concerned that people are going to be a bit blindsided by the additional changes. So, you know, this would be a good time to get all of that information out, really. Right. So that's why I think we need to do a little bit of outreach around this, maybe somehow get this word out that this is important. Um, the communities that there was an interesting discussion on the BEA uh, listserv that I didn't have time to finish reading, but uh, the communities, most communities that had it up for a vote, it's passed. There were a few communities that it didn't pass, that it was turned down, and that usually had to do with one of two things, um, the main one being there was some building expert in the room or a contractor or somebody who had a very specific um, you know, concern about what it would mean for building new somethings. And uh, having our building inspector really up on this and having someone in the room who can address any questions that come up, I think is gonna be really important because that was what killed it in at least two towns, I think, was there was a building expert in the room who had a problem with the new code and there was nobody there who could respond. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, I forget what the other issue was, but that was the big one. Um, all right, so this, we probably need to just, put in a process, what we expect a process to be here in our town. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about it, there are, whoops, for, for low rise residential buildings, single family homes and the like, right? There are three paths to making a home and this, to making a building, right? One of them is all electric, in which case you have to meet certain efficiency standards that are known as either HERS 45 or passive house, right? So all electric houses have to pass these standards. Um, or if you do a more efficient house, uh, you can use mixed fuels, you can use, you know, oil, but you have to have a solar install and you have to have the place wired for electric. All under all of these, um, I think they have to, they're end up, the houses end up wired for eventual electric heat and everything. So um, with mixed fuel, you have to be even more efficient. You have to have solar, right? It's, and if, and then there's a zero energy pathway, which means that you're either a HERS zero, your house is completely makes its own. I think, I think our new school will probably, is our new school considered a HERS zero? I don't know, but I think it's considered zero energy, right? Net zero? So anyway, there's three different pathways to getting there and different rating systems that you can use. Um, this HERS and FIAS, and these are all different rating systems that are used by builders um, and building engineers. Um, all new homes that are really big have to use all electric or zero energy. There's no mixed fuel in a big home. So this allows us, this, this takes care of the problem that right now the cheapest way to heat is still methane. And, you know, right now we can't access methane in Amherst anyway, so this may not affect us, but low cost housing is still often, you know, you often might want to build it with methane because it's still cheapest, unfortunately. Um, what if we should say that though, Lori? I mean, I don't think for a brand new build, we can say that with any guarantee. No, we can't. You're right. You're so, so I think we should be careful about that. Oh, and there is an additions and alterations thing, the same as stretch code. So for housing, there is, um, oh, this is the same as the stretch code, right? So there isn't, okay, sorry. Yeah, so there's not a specialized code for additions and alterations. It's the same as the stretch code. 
Okay. And since all of these, this just gives us a little additional impetus uh, to move toward fossil free fuel buildings. Lori, I think there's a trigger if yeah. an addition is over a certain size. I believe it's a thousand square feet. Yeah, I think so too. Right. And that's going to trigger work in the entire building. I think that's correct. Yeah. All right. So um, there's a specialized code for multifamily housing, uh, which has two different steps. It steps up next year. So uh, for multifamily housing, it has to be a passive house if it's five stories or less. If it's, if it's um, or hmm, passive house required for five stories or less if over 12,000 square feet. Okay, so it has to be passive house if it's big. And if it's larger, there's some other rating that I don't know. I, says, I forget what this even stands for, but there's another rating that it has to hit. Um, yeah, it, it, the Teddy is, it's like a total energy demand. And what they're trying to do is create a, it, the Teddy I think is very much a response to not trying to overwhelm the grid. It's all about peak demand right, okay. and minimizing that in, in buildings. And so it has nothing to do with annual energy. It's really uh, limiting the spikes. Okay, interesting. Which also would in turn limit yeah. annual energy. But that, that's sort of the, the basin. There's a heating teddy and a cooling teddy right. that they're establishing. And, and I still don't know anyone who knows how to calculate it, but... <laughs> Seems like a decent idea. Yeah. Um, and then next year, the passive house standard becomes a standard for all residential buildings over 12,000 square feet, which is interesting. And there's this third code for commercial buildings um, that I, again, this is all covered in that DOER presentation in some detail, so I won't go into it. But again, there's three different possible building types. And this is not excluding the multifamily, which was covered by the other one. So all electric, passive house, and it can have gas or other fuel, um, so long as it has the solar on site, it's feasible. And in all of them, the electrification has to be there. The electric wiring has to be there. I mean, I think that's the main thing about this code is every building that's built is built to um, a standard where that has to be able to support electric for EVs, for electric vehicles, and for uh, heat pumps and anything else you might need. All right, and that was all, the rest of these slides are about the stretch code. Oh, so solar photovoltaics. Um, yeah, okay, so there were some questions that I'm still trying to figure out, uh, but I think we just answered this one. And the other question was, what are the major ob obstacles to adoption in Amherst likely to be? And I think Stephanie picked up on one of them, which is we need to let people know. The rest of these slides are on the stretch code. I didn't bother. The DOER presentation talks about the stretch code first and then the specialized code. And I didn't really think it was necessary to go over the stretch code. We're already there. The question is, what comes next and how does it differ? And I tried to hit on those points in the first what, eight slides or something like that. So what do people think? Should I patch this thing up a little bit? Maybe get Stephanie to help with that one process slide and or any slide you want, Stephanie, and put it on the town website. Or Vasu. Hey, yeah, sorry I'm late. Um, Laurie, so this is, what are we doing this for again? This is like more of an education and FAQ section for- No, we're, we're trying to get the town to adopt the specialized code. Okay. <laughs> so. I, I spoke to a town council member a couple of days ago, and the an email was sent out to Lynn. Uh, Stephanie, I'm not sure what Lynn's role is, uh, but the ask from us and, and from me was whether we can be part of a town council meeting where Jesse, maybe you can present information and answer any questions. And then if we need to build an FAQ, after the fact, because there's going to be public comments after. Um, and so I, I think that's 
also in progress, Lori. So I'm yeah, not that, sure. And that's what I was like. right. And what I was trying to do was was block out a presentation to be okay. used at exactly something like that, right? So if you're going to go in front of the town council, you need some materials with you, right? Yeah. And I, I looked at what the BEA has been, what other communities have been doing. Most of them have been starting with the DOER slides and then adding historical stuff about their own town, where we are now, uh, what the process is, some yeah. you know town specific things. So that's sort of what I tried to do. I took half a dozen slides yeah. out of the DOER um, slide deck and then elaborated it with some Amherst stuff. Yeah, I think what we should also add is uh, what's the process look like? What's and then there is a toolkit from BEA, I think. That, that's this slide. Okay. That okay. was a slide I specifically need your or Stephanie's help. Someone needs to fix this slide up because this is a generic slide. And the question is, what is the process in Amherst? There's also some additional information. I'm trying to pull that now. Uh, it, it also has examples of how the other town towns have gone about adopting. <laughs> right, that was the BEA website. There's literally dozens of these. Yeah, there's so much information out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I looked at about two of them. And then, you know, I, I get all the emails from BEA. So I've been, I, I did as much as I had time for, Basu. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised you were working on it. You're working on everything now, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's near and dear to my heart. I, yeah. I didn't work on the next thing that's on the agenda that I was supposed to work on. So <laughs> this I thought was more important. I, I agreed that this I thought was the more important thing that we could be doing. Yeah, so so I'm trying to get some time on the calendar where we can present to the town council. Um, and I think it might be possibly some best practice going forward and how do we connect with the town council directly can we be part of their meetings going forward and address some of the questions that they have up front instead of emails that I've been sending back and forth and it's taken, it's been a month and two months now since the last email went out. So I, I think we should think about a different way to approach this and uh, Shalini is who I spoke to and she agreed that we can change the way we're approaching and connecting, having town council connect with ECAC in a in a different way than just via emails through town manager. Um, so, and, and we have that as part of our charge is we can, we can continue to be the ears and, and voice for climate change. And we can help the town council think about what goals that they need to take on and, or, you know, how do we approach a certain problem? Vasu, did you hear the part of this this discussion where I was talking about what the major obstacle was in other towns? Um, yeah, I missed that. There was a there was a big long discussion on the BEA listserv that uh, one of the biggest problems that a couple of towns had that didn't pass they they came up for a vote and they did not pass the specialized code was because there was a building expert in the room who had some specific concern, and mm -hmm. there was nobody there who could respond to it. So I think having Jesse up on this is really important. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. I think, I think we should volunteer Jesse to, to, to give a presentation. Which, which I, it's, that sounds great. I'm more than happy to do it, but I also, and, and I see Stephanie and Laura have their hands up, but just quickly to respond to that, <clears throat> I think putting contractors in the room, putting other people who are not on our committee in the room, architects, engineers, contractors, people, as many people as possible, who have that capacity to respond yeah. um, would be, and I can, I, I think we can, and, and I guess, do those need to be Amherst, those would need to be Amherst residents, correct? I don't know, Stephanie? Not necessarily. I mean, if you're talking about, I mean, people would identify themselves. Um, they don't have to be Amherst residents if they're speaking to a particular expertise. Okay. Um, but you know, you have, but I would point out that you do have experts that live in the town. So I don't know that you need to go outside the town. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be all that hard. And um, but I think Laura had something to say too, and I would let her go before me. Yeah. Okay, so Laura, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I just was thinking that it's I think this sounds like the 
the right approach. I guess the question I have is the timing and, and what the order should be. I think we'll have an easier go at town council is if we have the support of town staff on this. So I'm wondering if we should maybe start with Stephanie helping us talk to town staff or, you know, to your point earlier, Lori, like having, you know, making sure it's clear that it's, that we're addressing some of their concerns in our process. Um, our building I folks. I imagine that's a question that the town council will have is what impact will this have on staff regarding, right. um, you know, permitting and things like that. Um, I really like Jesse's idea of having people in the room that can that can speak to it. I also think, and this is sort of maybe more pie in the sky, but to your earlier point about the impact on the emissions, it would be interesting if um, we could sort of map out like how many like what is our expect does the master plan have like sort of a assumption on how much new development we'll have over the next 10 or 15 years um or can we look at old data and say generally we put in two new houses a year or 10 new houses a year or whatever it is sort of understand what actual impact this will have um both on our ghg goals and also just on the like the number of so like if those houses were built without this code, what would the impact of that be versus building with this code? Um, that's just something that's popping into my mind, both in terms of like showing that it does have an impact, but also in terms of showing that like, it, you know, we don't, we're not building a ton, I don't think. So it, it may actually not be that big of an impact either positively or negatively. Right. Thank, thank you, Laura. That's good. I'm trying to write down some of these suggestions. Um, Stephanie? Um, yeah, sorry. So there were a couple of things. I think one was um, just about the um, process with the with working with the council. I think Vasu, um, you know, uh, you request to be on the agenda, you know, for a town council meeting. You just request to discuss the specialized stretch code. And it might, maybe you want to have a meeting with Lynn and Paul Bockelman first. Um, that might be a way to sort of approach that piece. As far as town staff, um, I think I already discussed at the last meeting that the town manager has reached out to town staff about the specialized code, because um, I think Vasu, your outreach to counselors did get to Lynn, which got to Paul, which got to Paul trying to get more information. Um, I do think it's really important for you to make sure that you have a discussion with the inspections folks, um, specifically the building commissioner who is um, who they report to, especially because I think um, if they believe that it will be, um, that this isn't the right time, because I think I've already heard some um, reference, I think, Jesse, when you and I spoke with the building commissioner about this a while ago, what he said was, there's already going to be an updated stretch code. So that's already going to be more stringent. And then it would be better to wait, you know, a year or till the next round to sort of, or the next year to bring that specialized code on so that people can sort of get used to the updated stretch code and then the specialized code won't be as much of a stretch. That was at least how I heard it. And Jesse, you can correct me if I didn't hear that properly. Um, so I think you want to make sure that you include or have some conversation with him ahead of time, because I just don't want this to be a situation where, you know, you're sort of trying to push something through and then staff is on a different page. I think you want to just hear what he has to say and go from there. It, I think, Stephanie, it, I, it would make sense to maybe to have a repeat and say, mm -hmm. we met whenever we met a year ago. You gave us this recommendation. The climate committee had a strongly felt and unanimously voted to, to push to do this as quickly as possible. 
it's been a, a num any number of months. How do you feel? So I, I, to keep the consistency, I'd be happy to sort of update Rob on our progress and tell him what we're thinking. Um, which I agree, it's a great idea. It would be a shame to be like, hey, give us your opinion and then never tell them that we're going to do something completely different. Um, is Rob the building inspector? He's, he's the, the building commissioner. 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 So he's the, Rob Mora. So I, I, I would love the opportunity to update him on, on where we are and, and get sort of the next round of input. And I thought Dave Wiskavitz was also very useful at that meeting too. So. Yeah, Dave, no, Dave Wiskavitz is the senior inspector. Okay, Dave is the senior inspector. I think I've met him. Um, so sorry, real quick then. So Jesse, you're going to reconnect with Rob and I'll work with Paul and Lynn to get some time on the calendar, um, one of the meetings that we can go to uh, to present on the specialized code with the town council. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, one other thing, one thing to remind Dave and Rob about uh, that there, even, even DOER um, recommends that if you adopt the code today, you don't implement it for six months. So, um, and we did the same thing when we did the stretch code some years ago. We did. Yeah, we're shooting for July, 2024. Why not January? <laughs> Six okay. months is the min, right? Is the minimum. I think that's what we uh, on the letter to the town council. I mean, it, right? But the, we're, more than, we're, more than, we're more than a year away from. Yeah, but we're talking. It, you know, going to the town council, getting all right, public feedback. Okay. Yeah, I think realistically, July twenty twenty four is what we were targeting. How do places like Boston do it so fast? <laughs> Well, there's a difference between, but there's a difference between a, a governing body voting to adopt it and it formally take taking effect, and that's what that six months to a year is. Okay. We want the vote sooner. Right. Okay. We're not saying okay. let's vote on this in July of 2024. Okay. Yeah. And I doubt any of these towns have. I don't know if it's in effect in any of these towns. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Okay, so the only request I have is if I can, uh, I will send, I'll, I'll just snip out those first nine slides and send them to you, Stephanie, for posting. But if you want to, you know, again, we should probably try to put something about what our actual process is on that, um, on that one slide about process. Uh, it probably needs to be reworked given the conversation we just had. Yeah, we can follow up on that separately. Yeah, okay. Um, just one more, one more oh. thought is, Lori, whether or not you have, did the BNA, BEA listserv actually say what the problems were that people were raising? Yeah, and yeah it's very detailed. It's all in there. <laughs> those. Um, yeah, there have been a number of different problems that have come up, and honestly, I've glazed there's so much, there's so much information that stuff just sort of glazed over. I just made the note that it was, you know, something about building inspector not or building somebody having, and there were a number of different ones that have come up uh, in the last. Is few that years. something you could forward out to us? I can. You can put. I, what I would recommend is you put yourself on the list, sir. I'll forward that to you. I'll try to find. There was one conversation. Oh my God! It has no, to, no more list, sir. Sorry. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, there's not one place that it's all. I mean, you know, there are these long conversations back and forth, and you have to dig down into it to find the, you know, to find the update. Somebody will send an update that Arlington just passed the stretch code, and somebody else will say, "Oh no, but we didn't," and here's why, and then there'll be a back and forth about that, all in the same email train. So it's like many, many topics in one email train. So it's a little hard to, I can try to fish through it a little more and find the important stuff, Jesse. If, yeah, I, I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. <laughs> so if it's easy, great, but yeah. yeah. if not. Yeah, and I'll send the toolkit. It's pretty comprehensive. I'll send it over right now. Yeah. I think, Lori, did you um, didn't you include a link to the toolkit in your toolkit? Yeah, there are several things that call themselves toolkits, but the Sierra Club one, I think, is the one that made it into the. That's the one I'm talking. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's that's good for packet. background. Yeah, it's all in your packet. The link to that is in your packet okay. that I sent. And, and that one's online for, too. Yeah, it's it's good for background, but it doesn't have a lot of detail about building in it. I, I pulled stuff from the first few slides out of there. Um, all right. So we should probably move on, although I think the rest of the, well, no, we do have some more things on here. The, the next thing on the on the agenda was also had my name on it, but I decided to work on the specialized code thing this week instead of the gas moratorium letter, because last week we sort of put that on hold. It wasn't clear what we were writing anymore because uh, it, it didn't actually make it onto the agenda at the end of the meeting. Um, so I was a little surprised to see it, but I also left it on just in case um, Andre was here, or there was something more to discuss. But I think that we have two issues that, you know, we still don't know if we should do something about or not. One of them is the, um, the fact that we still have a gas moratorium here and an official town policy of opposing the gas moratorium. Um, and our neighbor Springfield has a gas pipeline that's going in. So it's not clear to me anymore what if anything, we should be doing about all of that. Um, so for now, I did nothing. <laughs> uh, and that's all I'll say about that, unless anyone else has something they want to add. I mean, I think the only thing I would say to that is, is I think where the conversation landed was we should be, it, it may not make sense to, I guess one thing I'd like a point of clarity, there's a difference in my mind between seven years ago, Amherst wrote a letter saying, please remove the moratorium and us having like an official, like bylaw or resolution or something on the books that says we don't like the moratorium. So the, the, to me, those are two different things. And if it's the latter, if it, or the former, if it's like we wrote a letter once in 2016, I'm actually not that concerned about that. I think what we can do is write a new letter that says we have, now we have climate, we have climate goals. We have, um, we want to end our reliance on fossil fuels. We want the state to step up and do more. If we could pass, if we could, in that letter say we also just passed the specialized code that would be even better right but like that and we don't think we should be investing in pipelines in the western in, in like you know whatever we can talk about that generally as opposed to talking about a specific problem i think that's where the conversation landed um i don't think we have enough clarity and that's where andre needs to come back in on like what i tried to ask around to see what this potential our position on the moratorium was and the only thing that came up was some letter yeah. so in that case i'm actually not too concerned about that um it, unless it's something different yeah what is the outcome we're hoping for here no pipeline in springfield and a community that very clearly opposes additional natural gas hookups but yet, but yet supports no fossil fuels. But it's a letter from ECAC addressed to the state? To that's what, that's what we're trying to figure out. So I think initially there was conversations about like, do we get our town council to write a, a note of support to about this, the Springfield pipeline? And I think the answer is, like we're not sure if that would actually do anything and the the lift to get our council to do that when they have so many other things on their plate when we have other things we want them to do like the specialized stretch code is right. probably not that's we could probably do more by just having ecac engage on with focus more on just the generalities of getting the whole state off fossil fuels yeah, is my take. Dwayne? Yeah, I'm not sure if I followed that all completely, but it seems like in terms of outcomes, um, the most tangible and effective outcome and appropriate, I think, for us is to um, 
ask the town council to make to make a statement that they they're in favor of the more of the moratorium on, on our town. Um, um, that seemed to be sort of our local issue, and, and then I think you know at that point, then to make a more credible letter uh, to the state uh, stating that the, the town has just made this decision. Uh, we think it's important for um, uh, for the rest of Massachusetts or, or other towns to, to, to do likewise. Yeah, I believe I remember correctly, Andra had mentioned that we need this letter out by end of May. Yeah. She had a timeline. And so I, I don't, yeah, I don't know if this is going to add value anymore. That, that was a different letter. She was she was looking for for town support. I, I think she was looking for town support of uh, of the of the stop climate, whatever the name of that group was that is trying right. to stop the pipeline. And that group's web page has on it a whole list of community organizations that are opposed to the pipeline, but none of them were government organizations. None of them were town government associated organizations. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I don't know because she, Andrew hasn't been here, but I think she imagined us adding our name to that list, writing a letter supporting the Stop the Pipeline movement, um, or maybe asking town council to do so. But I, I don't see any other towns doing that. So I'm not sure that's the right way to go. That's why we had, that's how this discussion got started. I actually yeah. wrote a letter <laughs> to do that, that I still might just send to the local paper in the next couple of days if I have the bandwidth. Um, but yeah, Lori, I think we should drop this from our agenda. We've talked about it and we don't have Andra here. Yeah, and I, I don't know what effect we're, this is going to have. I mean, I, if we I individually think, want to go to that website. Yeah, no, I think I think we should keep talking. What, what made it onto the agenda was the gas moratorium. And I think the gas moratorium probably should stay on the agenda. What do we do about the gas moratorium in Amherst? Should we do something? Yeah. I think if we drop it from the agenda, I think it's worth saying to the public, anyone that's here now or anyone that sees this meeting, go to the website, check it out. If you think it's something you want to sign, sign it. Our chances are objecting to investment in natural gas, which is not specifically designed to curb leakage, is probably a good objection to make. We don't know. Go be a citizen. <laughs> All right, any more commentary on that one? If not, uh, Vasu, you're up next, annual report. It's my turn, okay. And if you want to take the meeting from here, I should have offered it to you when you came in as the chair. Oh, no worries, no, no go, go for it, Lori. Um, I don't wanna step on your toes in between. No. All good. Um, so I think I mentioned this last time and we only had, we talked about it briefly, but trying to figure out, Jesse, I remember maybe about 10 months ago, you brought up that things need to be easier for us, especially when we're writing these reports, can we build a template that we could just fill in going forward? And that was the thought that I had when I started putting this together. Um, and so the intent here is to have uh, hopefully a short document, um, but our talk about our five focus areas that we've been working on, and then any other items outside of these five focus areas that we've worked on, and then specifically talk about community engagement. So uh, the festival, the couple of festivals that we were part of, and the education series, and then also start discuss discussing the town manager goals for 2024. Now this is going to be in draft state. This conversation will need to continue for the next two months. And as part of the budget cycle, we'll need to have a discussion with finance and with the town council to make sure that the goals that we're recommending make it into the town manager goals for the following year. And that was the intent behind this. I, I think this is otherwise pretty straightforward uh, with the intent. Um, now, the other point that I was try I'm trying to make here is, is around you know, these five different sectors that we've all been working on. Does it make sense for each of you 
well, obviously you're, you're more familiar with your area, you worked on it over the last year. Does it make sense for you to work on your specific sector, summarize it, send it to me, I'll compile all the information. But they, um, within each sector, the way I have this set up here is talk about accomplishments, talk about what any metrics that we have, effectiveness, and this is all part of the um, our charge, and that's why I've listed effectiveness and accomplishments. And I'll also talk about what do we need from the town uh, to be more successful in the upcoming year. That's how I have this set up. Pretty much every section has the same with accomplishments, any metrics if we have that, what was the effectiveness of that metric, and then what supports needed. Any thoughts? Thanks. Looks good. So if that's the case, can I send this over? If you're all in agreement, can I send this over to all of you to look at? I'll make some changes here, the summary section and some of the other sections here. Um, but if you can all get back to me in about three weeks with your specific sectors and what you've done, now I'll start compiling all the information and we can review it on the 21st of June. This looks like a really good model. I like it. Looking forward to reading it. Okay, that's all I had. Okay, so next on the list are staff updates. Hi, I have a few things. Um, first, uh, you noted earlier in the meeting that you all rece received the GZA final report on their outreach summary. Um, I didn't have a lot to say because um, Adrian had come in and done a presentation and basically she gave you the content. It's just now been put together with the pretty graphics. So it just looks more solid, but um, I think they did a great job uh, that went out to you and the Solar Bylaw Working Group, as well as all of the department heads. So um, I think they've done a nice job. Uh, I was pretty pleased with it. So I hope you'll enjoy reading it. Um, I wanted to give you- uh, Steve, also, I, I think Steve oh, has a question. Ahead. Sorry, Steve, go yeah. ahead. I, I had a question. Um, I, I had a chance to look at it briefly uh, last night. And there's a series of uh, column charts in there that show values, acreage for different sort of categories that they present. Um, but it's it's hard on those column charts to actually get the actual, actual acreage numbers. Is there a table that lists the values behind the column charts that could be made available? Um, I can, I might have some of that raw data. So let me just make a note to myself and I can also ask. Um, okay. Steve, but I would, if you wouldn't mind, can you just shoot me an email with your specific request so that I'm clear on what I'm asking her for? Okay, sure, I can do that. Um, that would be great. Um, okay. And, and I guess I wonder too, maybe that table data may be online when the maps get put online by the town GIS staff. Yeah, so um, yes, so I can, um, I don't know where exactly we'll house it all just yet. Um, I, I've got another update that will probably tie this all together. Okay. Um, so if I can get through that to there, I'll go ahead. Hopefully, be able to get to your point. Um, so I just wanted to give you an update on the mapping tool, which is that I met with Mike Warner. He's been putting it together. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, some of the some of the data uh, comes from other sites. So he's basically just loading other um, existing mapping tools. For instance, um, one of the ones that, that I wanted him to make sure he included was one on agricultural soils, because I know that's something that the, the solar bylaw working group is very interested in having access uh, to the information. So he's going to work on that. Um, you know, it takes a while, but he should have a draft to me by Friday. So I'll be hopefully taking a look and meeting with him 
Um, and Duane was on a technical review committee with me. So we may just do a quick technical review committee um, update. You know, so Duane, I might ask you to just sort of join me in that meeting again, just to sort of look at what he's put together. Um, so that will be coming, I would say that's probably about a week or so away, maybe. I'm hoping no later than that. Um, I also wanted to uh, let you know that the CCA process I had mentioned at the last meeting that we're going to have the launch the uh, comment period, the community comment period in um, in June. That's going to start June 1st and go through the 30th. And we have scheduled the big um, three community meeting, informational meeting for June 6th, and that will be June 6th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. All three communities will be represented. It will be Amherst, Northampton, and Pelham. And we're going to have our um, executives from each community say a little something, and then it'll be a presentation from Mass Power Choice, who is the consultant that's helping us with moving that CCA forward. That is um, fantastic. Thank that you. is really a very exciting milestone. Yeah. <laughs> very long. I mean, can you can you just provide the time of that meeting again? Uh, June yeah. 6? 6. 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you. Um, and then today I had a meeting about the community dashboard, which gets to what Steve was asking about earlier. Um, it's We're working with um, KLA Associates. Steve, you might remember them. They were one of the consultants that applied for doing the um, CARP. Um, they're creating our dashboard and we had a meeting today. So we were just sort of talking about um, the formatting and the content and all that. So that's going to be built up over time. It's not something that's going to show up just next week or even next month. It'll take a little while for us to sort of build it, build it. But um, what, what will be great about that is that we can have things like we will have the solar link to the mapping tool. We will have the report that GZA did. And then if we have raw data, we can actually have data there as well. So it'll be an opportunity. Um, it'll be my thing was I you know, I definitely want to make it easier for people to have access to the information. So this dashboard will really, really probably just take over the, the web page that we currently have for sustainability. Um, you know, so everything will kind of live on that dashboard. And one of the things we talked about too, is we really want to make it as a way to engage people to, you know, to have it be a call to action. And one of the things we talked about was heat pumps, but also solar. Um, and, you know, having an opportunity for people to um, sort of go through the process of, you know, here's our mapping tool. Does your site look like it <laughs> solar is feasible on your property or on your house? Um, you know, then what would be the next step? And sort of to have these series of steps that will sort of help get people through the process. Um, and we'll probably do that for heat pumps as well. You know, we'll probably have a section on you know, installing heat pumps. So there's going to be a lot of information. Um, and it, you know, um, you can look at, I think Cambridge would be a great example for you to take a look at their, their community dashboard and how theirs is set up. Um, ours won't be exactly like theirs. Every community is a little different, obviously, but, um, but the information will all live there. So I'm really, really excited about, about that moving forward. And then our fellows will be with us really soon. Um, like I said, that's coming, um, the week of June 5th, I think, is their first week. So Kate, uh, Caitlin Hart and Miguel uh, Gunther Rees um, will be joining us. And Caitlin is doing the GHG inventory update, and Miguel is going to be working on the building inventory. So uh, really excited about having them both with us. And then last, I just wanted to let you know that I attended um, a New England Municipal Sustainability Network meeting last week, and we dovetailed it on the um, climate migration conference that Antioch University put on, and the new climate chief was there, which was really nice because there was a small um, or, um, reception the night before the Antioch conference uh, where she spoke, and it was kind of an interview with her, and um, not a lot of people. So it was a really inf intimate setting and really nice. So um, I had sort of asked her a question and then was able to meet her afterwards and just follow up and and said, you know, um, talked about, about solar and our solar development and how, you know, asked if they were really addressing the, you know, the sort of 
struggle and you know between sort of um, land use and um, solar development. So how was the state going to be tackling that? And she said it's kind of a big issue they're looking at, and um, I think they're going to be having some more guidance coming out in the not too far future. But one thing is she seems very accessible, and I think she encourages people to email her. So I'm just putting that out there that as a committee, um, I don't think anyone should hesitate. You know to uh, if there's something of concern, I say we start reaching out to the climate chief. And uh, that's it. That's my update. Thanks. Can I just offer, sorry, you mentioned the climate chief. There's, um, you know, importantly also, um, just in the paper this, uh, this week was uh, um, an announcement of the appointment of a, of a, of a um, rural economy um, uh, officer, if you will. Out of, out of economic development secretariat, um, who will be particularly having her eyes on um, opportunities to support the rural economies um, beyond energy, all, all things, but energy would be on that plate. Um, have, turns out to be Ann Gobi, who's a senator, was a senator. She's stepping down from her Senate state Senate position um, and is a um, well versed on on uh, issues on energy, um, from my experience. One other thing I want to mention, Stephanie, that you reminded me of as you were talking about the dashboard um, and heat pumps. Uh, one thing I noticed this week, which I'm uh, a little distressed about, is that uh, the Mass Save and the Green, what is it, Mass CEC, I think, had kept keeps a list of heat pump installers that they certify somehow. And that list used to be fairly limited. Um, I was trying to refer someone who contacted me as a result of last week's heat pump panel about it. Uh, I was trying to refer someone to it. And um, I went looking for it. And that list now has everyone and their brother on it. it. It's got hundreds of contractors, some of whom I've never heard of. They don't, they don't seem to be in the area, but they're all listed as serving our area. So I don't know what happened to that list, but it seems to have been made useless <laughs> by by having been expanded to the point of unrecognizability. Um, so I'm, I'm a little distressed about that because all of the contractors on it used to be people that I, I, I contacted most of them. I mean, there weren't more than maybe 12. Um, they were probably, yeah, I mean, I think they used to be more vetted. I, yeah. think, you know, with this sort of whole scale push, you can't have 12 yeah, I know. Serving the entire state. <laughs> so, or even just the region. I mean, even just right. our region, if you're going to be pushing heat pumps at the scale that we're promoting, right. so you're going to need more. But I don't know what I don't know what their process is. Yeah, and I don't either. And I'm worried that I, I wish there were some way for us to get a list of local providers that we know can actually do this right, because it's so tragic when it's done wrong and it is done wrong. Um yeah, well, yeah, the one, so the one thing that we can't do as a town is specifically recommend one business over another. Um, it's one thing if the agency does that as part of their, you know, process that's sort of different than a municipality. Yeah. So we can't. Um, Maybe us as individuals could put something together that would be well you're still a committee yeah, okay. <laughs> you're still the committee for the town right. yeah so i don't think that you can actually say like you should call this installer of this one and when we did the solarize program that was part of a state program mm -hmm. we interviewed um an installer and we chose an installer because that was how the program was set up was that you worked with an okay. installer so it was a little different which is why it was easier for us to sort of say we're working with this one company yeah um so, and I hear you and I don't disagree that, you know, we don't want to just be unleashing anybody on people, but what we've done is, you know, what, what we did do actually now that I, what we have done in the past and I, I would want to make sure this is still okay. Cause I did this years ago with wetlands, but when I was the wetlands administrator, I had put together a list of consultants in the area. But what I stated was, this is just a list, a partial list um, there are many more. This right. is to get you started. You can certainly call anybody and work with anybody. So yeah. putting together that kind of a list with that kind of a statement might be okay. I just need to make sure because that was years ago. 
I just need to make sure, first of all, if we're still even using something like that for the wetlands, I can check in with Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, but then to make sure, like through the town manager, like, is this actually an okay thing to put together? So mm -hmm. we could, you could start to put that together. I mean, because you already seem to know a lot of, you know, the more local folks. So put mm -hmm. it together, you know, and let me just vet it through the town manager's office. And we can always add the statement ourselves if there's like specific language we should add to it. I can do that. Okay. All right. Just a thought. Uh, ECAC member updates is next. Do we have any updates from anyone on anything else? not then what are our items for the next meeting agenda we had a couple of them um let's see what did we have so far well we have the um annual report maybe for which meeting was that going to be for that's june 21st so for june 21st annual report next week we can certainly keep on going with the updates. Um, oh, yep, go ahead, Steve. Um, I think it might be useful after the GZA mapping results are available through the town website and, and we've had a chance individually to look at those. It would be nice to have a time where we can discuss those. I suspect we'll all have various questions about what is the data, how to interpret it, how to make sense of it. So it might be useful to have that as an agenda item. Um, maybe not for the next meeting, but the meeting following the next. Okay. And Laura? And Dwayne. Laura first, then Dwayne. Oh, so, uh, sorry. Oh. Minute taker prerogative. Steve, sorry. I was trying to update a different part of my minutes. Could you state that request again? Just briefly. Sure. Yeah, a, a request for an agenda item to discuss the GZA uh, mapping results after they're posted online yeah. to, to give us an opportunity to um, ask each other questions to try to sort of make sure we understand the results. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, Laura. Yeah, I think we talked about this a little bit. There's two things we've talked about in the past that I think we should revisit, um, although I'm agnostic to the timing of them. One is the rental housing bylaw energy efficiency stuff. I know Steve was gonna maybe pick that back up when the semester ended, which I know just happened. So I won't give you too much <laughs> slack, Steve, <laughs> um, but we might wanna add that back to a, a future agenda. And then, and I'm happy to help with that. Um, then the other piece that we we talked about a bit, I think last time or the time before, that would be a, a new bit of work is um, focusing on what we do know we all want with solar, which is getting more solar in the places where we all want it. <laughs> so parking lots, rooftops, whatever. Um, and so I'd like to figure out what we as ECAC could or should be doing to facilitate that discussion, um, sort of how to be proactive about getting solar in the places where we where we want solar um, and what would that take and, and all of that. So I don't have much more information than, than that to say about it, but um, I'd like us to explore maybe what, and I can take the lead on maybe developing some thoughts, but um, to explore what would be some of our levers that we could um, we could explore there. Right, and Vasu? Yeah, and to add to what Laura said, I think we'd also discuss the possibility of a, of a field trip, Steve, um, just to create some awareness in the community about solar. Um, I mean, it's summer, I don't know how many people are going to have, but um, that's something that I don't know if you've given that a thought. That's something that we should do. I would be happy to. 
give a tour to anybody who would like on the committee or, or out in the public to, of the Hampshire College solar fields. I know I've, I've given that for um, different different um, school groups. I gave it to uh, Martha Hanner. She called me up and um, we had a pleasant day looking at those facilities. Um, be happy to do that. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Should we target a specific time, just like uh, how we have the education series, we send it out to the community ahead of time saying this is a specific date. Is that something that we want to do for the field trip? We could do that. Uh, uh, yeah, set a specific date and, and, yeah. and invite our committee as well as members of the public to, to meet us there. Do you two want to decide on a date and then we'll just announce it at the next meeting? Or do you want to decide on it right now? Sure, maybe we can um, get, yeah, work that out. I probably should check with Hampshire College, um, make sure it's okay with everybody there, and then we can announce a date. Thanks, Steve. And who else? Vasu. The only other thing is we should probably get, I, I think there's going to be some work going on uh, individually on this um, specialized code, but maybe we should just get an update on that in the next agenda, on the next agenda. And then if Andra is back, maybe we should bring up again the gas moratorium issue. But let's wait for Andra before we discuss that one. So if there's nothing else, we should move on to public comment. Uh, we have two community members. If either of you would like to speak, please raise your hand. So seeing no hands, I think we can adjourn. And One last comment, Laurie. So I'll be out next, well, in two weeks, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be traveling. I'll be in California for a work trip. So okay. Uh, yeah, I, you'll have to chair the next meeting. Okay, let me make a note. I will be gone the week after that, but I might still be able to attend. I'm just going to be on vacation. You mean Next meeting is like after June. that, or you said huh? week after that. Did you mean meeting? The meeting after that, rather. Yeah, the June. So next time is June sixth. June eighth, uh, seventh. Seven. Right, and after that would be June twenty one, and that'll be right in the middle of my vacation. But I don't know if I'll be able to attend or not. That one, we'll have to we'll have to see. I collected people's calendars and I don't, it doesn't look like. I didn't send it because I only decided that this week. <laughs> yeah, for most that I did receive, it doesn't look right now like we have any um, threats of not having a quorum, but I'll I'll double check. Right. And Lori, if you, yeah, if you have those dates, just get it to me. I'll send that to you, yeah. All right, move to adjourn anyone? I agree sure. to adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> All right, we got it. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, have a good week. Thanks week, for all. sharing, Lori. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vasu. Bye, all.